Hi guys, Patrick Fulop here at Effective Martial Arts Home Edition. And today we got a very special one for you. I am joined by the one and only Mr. Jerry Liu from Fight Commentary Breakdowns. So welcome to Effective Martial Arts. Jerry, very nice to have you on the show. Absolutely. And Patrick, it's an honor to be on your show, especially I found you through Ruckus's video and I really enjoyed your honesty. I really enjoyed your honesty and your expertise. And, you know, what you're trying to do is what I aspire to do. So thank you, man. Thank you for putting yourself out there. It's my pleasure, uh, Jerry. And uh, for a little bit of background, for those who don't know uh, who Jerry is, so he has a very popular YouTube channel named Fight Commentary Breakdowns. So link in the description, you can go and check it out. Uh, currently, at the time of this recording, it has 149,000 subscribers, uh, many videos, uh, several million views. Uh, so, And he really focuses on something that's very complementary to what we do on this channel, uh, is analyzing actual fights and a lot of uh, Kung Fu versus MMA type content, uh, other styles as well. So pretty much all the styles uh, and mixes of styles that you can think of. And I think that's very interesting because we can actually see in real time what works on average for most fighters. And that's something that we don't focus that much on in this channel. So I thought uh, who better to bring on and to illustrate the points that I've been talking about. Uh, I made some videos on uh, my personal experience as a Kung Fu practitioner and why I transitioned to more modern uh, combat sports methodologies and my approach to martial arts as I teach it right now and as I practice it right now. But uh, I think it's helpful to see. So I've mentioned those uh, challenge matches, but we never actually shown that footage on this channel. So I thought, uh, Jerry, it would be great to uh, bring you and uh, share with our viewers those most notorious matches. So I'm really excited about this. Absolutely. And Patrick, just a little bit brief summary about my journey. So I started yeah. out doing Kung Fu 2. Um, I was running around. So my parents put me in Chinese school when I was living in Chicago because, you know, every kid who's the son or daughter of these STEM immigrants in America have to be mm. super high achievers. So I went to Sunday school in addition to regular school. So mm. Sunday school, one day I was running around and I collided head on with another kid my age and I had a standing concussion. Whoa. So if you guys ever wonder why Jerry's so weird, it's probably from that concussion when he was like five. <laughs> but anyways, my my dad was afraid that um, I would get bullied because what happened was when I, when, when I had the standing concussion, I cried. So my mm. dad being the Asian dad's like, Boys aren't supposed to cry. Kids aren't mm. supposed to cry. Let's put him in Kung Fu. So next time he collides head on with someone, he'll give him a hook to the face. <laughs> so I, I was put into Kung Fu very soon after that. And um, when I went back to China about a year and a half later, I continued doing Kung Fu at what's called the Shao Nian Gong, which is like the um, – it's like a, like a state or government-funded kind of youth organization. So it's not profit-driven. And – my Kung Fu training for the first three years of my martial arts journey was actually pretty good. Like mm. we didn't spar that much, but we went as far as doing compliance drills, which mm. if you go to a lot of Kung Fu schools, they don't even do compliance drills. They're mostly Tao Lu, aka Kata. They're mostly yeah. just that based, but we actually did compliance drills. So at least we had a bunch of sequences muscle memoried into our minds, even though they weren't pressure tested. But um, that went far because I would get into fights all the time when I was a kid in China because I hated being in China. You know, I grew up in mm. Chicago. I loved America. I was very Americanized. And I was like, I don't want to be in China. So I would take it out on my, not my mm. friends, but my classmates all the time. I get into fights all the time. And I won 90% of the fights. So I thought my Kung Fu was so good. Oh my God. Oh my God. But really it wasn't my Kung Fu. It was just nobody else knew how to fight. So like, you they know. They had no training whatsoever. Yeah. You at least had So if you know a few more kicks and one throw, you'll beat them, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I also did a little bit of karate when okay. um, I was in Chicago because um very, very personal. But I'll, since you're, you put yourself out there, I'll talk about it. So my dad used to hit my mom. And so mm. I told one of my dad's friends about it because I, I saw him as a pretty cool, you know, uncle. And so, you know, he, he didn't know what to do, but he started teaching me karate because I guess in his mind, he's like, the best thing I can do is when Jerry gets a little older, he's not going to get bullied because, you know, kids from 
tough households either become the bully or they get bullied. So in his mind, he's like, okay, let's teach Jerry some karate in addition to mm. Kung Fu. So that way he's extra protected against people who can sense weakness. So he taught me some karate and that karate actually complimented my Kung Fu a lot when I was getting into fights in China years later. And I mm. never gave that credit for many years because I forgot about um, Uncle Richard as, as I would call him now teaching me karate. I forgot mm. about that because, you know, he only gave me like probably 10 lessons, but those 10 lessons did so much for kind of the neuroplasticity and the ability to kind of string along a bunch of moves together. So mm. like when I would fight as a kid, I never just spammed one thing. I always had combos and all my classmates were like, how the heck did he learn this stuff? How is he throw a punch and a kick? You know, mm. instead of just spamming a punch or spamming haymakers, I was punching and kicking and chopping. That was yeah, from well. karate. That was from karate. So oh, cool. Um, we'll step a little forward to um, um, seventh grade. I got into a fight. I was in America again. Seventh grade, I was in America. I was doing Kung Fu. Not very good Kung Fu compared to what I had in China and Chicago. Um, I went to I went to um, middle school and high school in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. So um, I got into a fight with a boxer. And okay. every punch this boxer threw, I couldn't even see. Right. And I was lucky that he never hit me in the face because he probably would have knocked me out. But... I hit him a few times, did some damage, but every punch he threw at me, I couldn't even see. That's how fast his hands were. Damn. So that should have been my moment if this were another universe when I went into mixed martial arts or boxing or kickboxing, but I didn't. I still was like, no, my Kung Fu was good. The only reason he hit me and I couldn't see his punches was because I wasn't kicking him. I wasn't keeping him into kicking range. So yeah. I wanted to have a rematch with him where I could kick him and throw him. But he, he like smartly walked away not because i would have beat him but because he would have knocked me out so mm. he show, was a better martial artist he's like i'm not gonna fight jerry because there's a big chance i'm gonna uppercut him or something and knock him out mm. so yeah i stopped my kung fu training because i was frustrated all the time in kung fu i'm like i don't feel like i'm learning much i still don't really know how to fight and there were so many egos and so i stopped mm. my kung fu training in high school and i i didn't do kung fu in college and i got back into martial arts in 2012 and it was only very sporadic training. And it started with American Kempo. I walked into a Kempo studio because it was right near my place where I was living. And I was like, this is kind of like Kung Fu, but they're actually trying to apply it. And it's not just emphasized on prettiness and aesthetics. Mm. So it started with Kempo. I did a little Wing Chun. And eventually, um, too many of my friends did jujitsu. So I got a little bit back into jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And then I got injured a few times. And then I ended up doing boxing and kickboxing. So right now I'm just doing kickboxing and a little bit of tricking. So I okay. have never claimed I know how to fight. I've got into many fights as a kid, but that doesn't mean I can fight. Doesn't mean I'm even an expert. I'm not a teacher. I want to make that clear to anyone who's not heard my spiel before on my channel. I'm just a guy who's seen a lot of stuff, been in a lot of interesting situations. You know, I've been jumped before. I got attacked by a guy with a chair. You know, I had teachers hit me before in, in China. So, like, I know what it feels like to get attacked by very different weapons. You know, I had a knife pulled on me. I pulled a knife on someone before. So I, I've had a lot of those experiences that many people watching our channels probably haven't had. Mm. And so, you know... Thank goodness I also have a brain so I can reflect on it and not make the same mistakes and stuff like that. And that's kind of where the channel started because um, when I started my channel, I was very sporadically tra training in martial arts. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I need something to give me an extra push to get back into it. And maybe this can reconcile all the years of Kung Fu training that I thought I wasted. And so that's mm -hmm. how it started. That's why I was so um, looking for Kung Fu footage right and um mm. that's where it started that's where all this like kung fu versus that started because i i was able to find kung fu footage because i speak chinese you know at like a high school level so i'm able to search regular stuff and um i was able to find clips that other people couldn't find so mm. that's how all those kung fu verse whatever videos started i just went on chinese social media and found some stuff and i know we're gonna talk and explore more about that that, that's really cool. And it's a, it's a very cool uh, to hear your story as well. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, back in the day, traditional martial arts was pretty much the only thing that existed, right? Their yeah. MMA was, wasn't really a thing back then. BJJ was kind of obscure. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, a lot of us came from that type of background. Um, and it's, it's cool to know that, yeah, you studied that and you had all those experiences. 
Uh, and it's funny how like sometimes we're confronted with evidence and we still want to believe in what we've been doing. Uh, been there, done that, definitely. Um, but I think just the fact that like you've spent so much time researching those matches and observing and analyzing and breaking it down, I, I would argue that that does make you an, an expert. Because like you've seen it and you spend some time reflecting on it, you've broken it down, you've talked to many other martial artists as well. So uh, I think we can get some good insights from your experience and those matches specifically. The goal being uh, one for entertainment, because some of those matches are quite entertaining for our viewers. Um, but, but also more importantly, for educational purposes, so that people, because... For our viewers on our channel, most of our, our viewers, they watch our videos because they want to improve as martial artists. And I think everybody that's a martial artist wants to get better. I think that's kind of the, the one of the essences of martial arts is working on yourself and, and improving your techniques, improving your skills. So hopefully we'll shed some light on what actually works, what doesn't, why that's the case, and uh, how to better uh, improve and improve faster. So that, that's the, the goal. Agreed? Awesome. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Cool. So, uh, yeah, let's get right into it. So, uh, the, the title of this video, uh, Top 5 Shocking Challenge Matches of uh, Kung Fu versus MMA. Mm -hmm. And um, let's get right into it with uh, number one. Yes. Take it away, uh, Jerry. So, the preamble, I call this the preamble video because this took place years before any of us found mm -hmm. out about all these hilarious matches. So, right. if people like, like Patrick and I, um, you know, or to examine evidence and really like reflect that should have been the time to reflect but you know it went past the radar until it started blowing up in 2018 so this mm -hmm. one happened in 2013 mm -hmm. and this is our notorious notorious person named Yu Cheng Hua the Wing Chun master mm -hmm. and um can you see my screen you can see my screen okay I got it yep. so this is Yu Cheng Hua the very notorious Wing Chun master Mm -hmm. And um, he was the one who later, and we'll examine that later, got beat up by the one-armed boxer. Mm -hmm. So here he's talking about how he's a master, you know, he, he, he's directly descended from an Ip Man lineage, Wang Sheng Liang or something, taught him or something. So he's making all these claims, right? And mm -hmm. the really funny thing about this, he's on a show and the show wants to make him look good. So they pair him up with some random dude who... I guess it's supposed to be just some random dude from the audience, probably not someone who knows how to fight because again, mm -hmm. they're not going to pair him up with some dude who will make him look bad. Right? So it's like, okay, how will he look against someone they purposely paired him up with to just to, to, to like show off his wing chunk. So mm -hmm. at, he's like a third generation Sunday trend. And that's what it says here. So, yep. you know, he, he's just doing some demonstrations, you know, hitting the, nice. it's that's called the Mu Zhuang, the wooden man or whatever. Yeah, in, yeah. in English. I got one of those. Yeah, one of those again, he, you know, he's first of all, this guy's like 90 pounds soaking wet. You can tell like the he's shirt's shiny, so, yeah. uh, so baggy even on him. It's, it's, he, he doesn't lift much weights, I yeah, think. <laughs> he doesn't lift much or, you know, it's like, I mean, there is an argument for saying there's, if he's just bone, he might hurt you more. It's, if it's bone on bone, but look at, look at this, look at how, look how skinny he looks, man. Mm. But anyways, let's, let's not judge. Let's look at how he does. So this random dude from the audience, they pulled. Okay. So it's a random dude. They pull from the audience and, um, it's probably not someone who knows how to fight because they don't want this guy to dwarf Yu Chung Hua's abilities. Right. So, okay. So we're going to jump a little forward. Okay. So this can you is make it full screen so that we can see. Yes. Yeah. Good idea. Good idea. All right. All right. So, um, so this is cool. I love the screen sharing. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. So, um, let me see if I can move this. Okay, here they go, here they go. Okay. So, a uh, random dude already, the Yu Chao Hua doesn't know any distance. Okay, so so he gives him some. Okay, he got kicked in the balls right there. Was it? Uh, can't, <laughs> Close can't to can't it. manage distance with the, that guy. That guy had a good sidekick. Like, Yu Chao Hua is not looking, overextending his punches. He's not doing well at all. Mm. He's not doing well at all, man. Like, look, look at the, 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 the judges are like, I don't know if it's making him look good. And then, you know, he did it. You're scared face. for him. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming this guy is, you know, not a good fighter because why would they try to make him look bad on the show? I mean, maybe the purpose was trying to make him look bad. So they actually pick like a Sanda fighter, like a kickboxer to spar him. But I really this, don't this, think the, so. This challenger seems to have like a little bit of training, but yeah, like, a little bit of training, right? Not Let's much. Let's slow it like down. 
So yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Like, and I think the um, maybe he had a little bit of sign dot training, but mm. you know, so that was the one inch punch, <laughs> you know, the one inch punch. Um, one inch so punch. that was him showing <laughs> the horrible. one inch. Yeah, you know, it's a pretty good magic trick, right? So but, okay, so I think what we can see from that, maybe uh, play the footage again, yeah, yeah. so that uh, we can comment on it. Yeah, uh, definitely. You 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 said it managing distance, right? Yeah. Uh, did, obviously, did, what style did this guy do? It's some type of Wing Chun, I guess. Um, Yu Chong Hua, yeah. Um, Ip Man Wing Chun. Ip Man Wing Chun, yeah. The the wooden dummy gives it away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, kicks, yeah. kind of kick blocks, bad timing. Yeah. But not no real perception of yeah. the danger linked to uh, distance. Yeah. Correct? And I will. I noticed something as the guy was throwing a roundhouse kick. Our, our challenger telegraphed one of the roundhouse kicks so much. So not this one, but the second one. And he, he reaches telegraphed- for the legs a lot too. Yeah. Like when, when the kick is coming, he put both hands down to reach. Check out it. his telegraph. Check out that telegraph. He telegraphs it so much and Yu Chong Hua couldn't read that. Yeah. He, he was just busy trying to do his own thing, but he didn't yeah. react to No, not at all. Yeah. And he gave his back. The, the shine that guy gave his back, but Yu Chong Hua didn't take advantage of that. At all, yeah. yeah. He didn't, no angles as well. No yeah. side steps yeah. really. And then look at the chin flailing out like that. Yeah, that's a common thing in Wing Chun. By the way, I, I didn't mention the interview that we did on your channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, we go in depth on uh, my personal experience in Kung Fu was mostly Wing Chun. So uh, mm-hmm. I go in depth on the, the seven fatal flaws that we explored. And the yeah. chin up is one of them. So we discussed that on your channel. Yeah. Uh, you guys should check it out if you haven't already. Link uh, mm-hmm. below. But yeah, definitely chin exposure, distance management. Mm-hmm. And, and overextending thing, his punches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and But despite the fact that he's overextending, there's very little power in his strikes. Exactly. That's another thing. He's he's almost like just slapping like he's light sparring. He doesn't seem like yeah. the Sanda guy's throwing much more power. Yeah. Well, it's there's one thing between like light sparring and, and controlling your punches mm-hmm. um, versus like not having the actual ability to generate power, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we mentioned that in our talk as well. It's, it's the stance, it's the hip motion, the weight transfer, yeah. uh, the throwing and the swinging of the punches. And definitely that's not that's not present in this yeah, case. You know, exactly. You don't see it in Yu Chang Hua. And um, Patrick, I'm so glad you mentioned this because my cross isn't good, right? The mm-hmm. reason is I don't put my shoulder into it. So yeah. every time I see myself throw a cross, my cross is here. I don't mm. put the shoulder in, right? right? So you can tell just looking at me, my jab is good, my mm. hook is good, but my cross is, is not going to generate the amount of knockout power that other people's crosses are. Like, yeah, I'm just the range, being yeah. completely honest. So, like, that's what um, Patrick and I are saying. If For those of you who wanted another way of explaining how you can look at someone and know if they can generate power, if they can actually hurt someone with yeah. their hits. Yeah. Well, I, like everybody has like a, like I would say a power range uh, based on like your weight, your size and your weight. Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the bigger you are, the longer range you have, the more you can hit. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can maximize your own potential by using correct techniques. And to some a certain extent as well, strength and conditioning will help as well. Uh, But like you can turn your hips, you can turn your shoulders, you can reach further, uh, you can hit harder that way. So I think the main takeaways from this first match was probably the guy uh, doesn't spar. I, I would go. I would think that he doesn't spar. He doesn't spar much, or at very least, he doesn't spar against like kickboxing style uh, opponents, right? Yeah. So he's yeah. definitely not used to that type of pressure. We could see yeah. right away. Yeah. Maybe he spars kind of Wing Chun style sparring, where you make contact with the arms and you try to touch the face, basically. But definitely not used to uh, to kicking and punching with any amount of real power. Uh, mm-hmm. So because of that. Distance management, angles are not there, chin exposure, and uh, lack of power in the strikes. I think that those are the main takeaways from this uh, first match. Anything yeah. else you think? Yeah. And Patrick, um, to incentivize viewers to keep watching, we're mm. going to watch the next match. And then I'm going mm. to explain to you how much real training he's had. Because mm. I actually found an interview. He explained it all. But in awesome. that interview, he also explained why he failed so much in this next match. So that's why I'll reveal all of that after we watch this next match. Awesome. Yeah, looking yeah. forward to it. So, guys, the next match now is also Yu Chang Hua, his famous fight against the one armed boxer Xiong Chen Chen. And this yeah. was the same event where our Xu Xiaodong, our MMA panda, MMA mad dog, fought Ding Hao, the student of Yu Chang Hua. So, this yeah. is the master of. Um, you, uh, Ding Hao fighting a one-armed boxer. Okay, okay. 
So we're going to go here. Um, and this referee is a famous Shui Jiao guy. Pretty cool dude. Um, mm-hmm. And this this is Xiong Chen Chen. Xiong Chen Chen had a botched surgery on his um, uh, right arm. And that's why he... Oh, so that's why he does it. the one-arm thing. Yeah. Okay. When we first watched it, we thought he was taunting the guy. But actually, he actually just can him. He has like a pin in there that could never get taken out. It's really okay. sad. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, man. Take care of your joints, uh, viewers. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to repair some sometimes when there's uh, too much wear and tear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that guy um, with the glasses was the guy who ruled the Xu Xiaodong versus Ding Hao match a draw. So that guy with yeah. glasses is notorious. Yeah. Oh. That, that's that's crazy. Maybe we'll have him to look at it again. I put it in the honorable mm-hmm. mentions because yeah. it's uh, it was quite notorious. Yeah. So you might have seen this before. It's a uh, one arm boxer. Versus Yu Changhua. Yeah, exactly. Yu Changhua. Yu Changhua. Yeah. Very good pronunciation, man. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's You're because the... French. French has a lot of sounds that Chinese had too. So French people learn Chinese That's... better than Americans. Okay. Yeah. All right. Round one. Yeah. So okay, his chin just out, man. Yeah. Our Wing Chun master's chin is out. Yeah. And uh, the boxer hides his chin. Yeah. Right? Yep. You can see like he gets slapped on the forehead, but he doesn't care. Yeah. Because again, the power is very limited. Yeah. Plus he can he can take it, right? Even yeah. if it were a powerful punch, you can take a punch to the head. Yeah. Much more than you can to the chin. Yeah. Yeah. But now he's so just he, about, I think no he's respect for his strikes elbow. whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. He's trying to kind of block a little parry, right? Do some of the Wing Chun trapping a little bit. A little bit, but the moment is gone every single time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I will and, tell you guys much more about that, what he claimed actually happened. I mean, to you and I, it kind of looked like a flash knockout, right? A little bit of a KO. Yeah. Is that it or it keeps going? Oh, it keeps going because he's arguing right now. And I only knew about this because I found the interview. He's arguing, no, he wasn't KO'd. I'll, I'll tell you more about this. But to us, it looks like he's KO'd, right? Well, it was a knockdown. It was not, yeah. not, not a knockout, but it was a mm-hmm. knockdown. Yeah. I, if I were the ref, I might have called TKO. it a TKO. Like a TKO, TKO for sure. Yeah, he looks a little dazed. Like you but this is striking weird. only, right? There's no yeah, ground? striking only. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Wing Chun side purposely wanted it on the ground because they said that in the ring with the mats and everything, um, it would affect the Wing Chun. That's why it's on the ground. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but like, I would call this a TKO because Yu Chunghua doesn't look – he doesn't look like he's coherent. He's requesting water to stall. You see the refs giving him water. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and now go. his hands are down. Oh, his hands are back up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really cool angle. I, I never even looked at it like this. So, um, wonder what's going on. Oh, okay. This is um my original. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So again, it's like. The zigzagging of the head. Yeah, yeah he's moving. Yeah. The head movement, man. That's another yeah. thing. His hammer has no power. He's not putting his hips or anything into it. Yeah, no weight transfer. Yeah, yeah no, no weight motion. transfer. Exactly. And very poor head movement. Yeah. Um, Look at that. Telegraphing his kicks and no power. Very flat-footed as well. Yeah. The, the mobility yeah. is very limited. Yeah. Whereas the boxer is much more quick on his feet. Yeah. Oh, he did tag the boxer. Yeah, once. he got him a bit on the yeah. chin, but yeah. not much there behind it. Yeah. Oh, the boxer's mad now. There we go. Oh, yeah. He's trying to do nine, 12 to six elbows. Yeah, yeah. I got. I saw a knee there too. Yeah. And so, so some some clinch work ish. Yeah. I do give him credit. He did tag that boxer that once. Yeah, he, the he got him once. Face went sideways. I saw. Yeah, that. he moved his. Yeah. He kind of yeah. rolled with it a bit. But yeah. No knockout power for sure, but exactly. he did touch Definitely him. No knockout power. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. His his um his hands are so low. Um, our Wing Chun master. What are yeah, you doing? Yeah, he doesn't what are really. They doing? Which is not. I mean, I I I I like the style of hands low. So a lot of uh-huh. fighters do that if your head movement is on point. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, but you you have to know your distance for sure, yeah. and it, it does yeah. clear up your vision. It gives you uh. It allows you to conserve energy and mm-hmm. possibly strike faster. It's good when you per, per primary strategy, strategy is to kick as well, hands a little yeah. bit lower. Yeah. But obviously, that wasn't uh, a measured uh, choice in this yeah. case. Yeah, exactly. 
So um, yeah, basically, um, and then it, it, sh- it shows um, what the, um, what the result was. And so the result. And was then the course, time was up. There, was there? A, yeah, the time was up. So oh, it only it, okay. lasted a round. They didn't go two rounds. Okay, and then it went to the judges, or yeah, what? and then it went to the judges. Okay. Yeah. So what was the verdict? Uh, the verdict, unfortunately, they they couldn't say this was a draw because obviously, like even just counting that knockdown, right? So, yeah. um, uh, so, so the boxer this, won. It was ruled, yeah. Uh, the boxer won exactly. Okay. So yeah, so you see the boxer, the boxer won this. Yeah. Unlike so, Xu Dong, who it was called a draw. <laughs> I know that's crazy. Yeah, that that was quite shocking indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think. Takeaways from this one, pretty much the same ones as in the previous match, or is the same fighter. Yeah. Anything else when, you think uh, in terms of takeaways? When I first started sparring, um, when I started uh, kickboxing, one of the first things I would do is sometimes I would accidentally sh- go like this. I would hit with both hands because you know it's the cross lateral, right? Like mm-hmm. your your hands are not always used to doing separate things. So right, sometimes right. I get oh, pressured. You just kind of, yeah. yeah, and I start going like this. Just just because all this is going right. when you're pressured. Suddenly you're like, yeah. So you saw that a lot. You saw that flailing in your tall flailing the arms. Yeah, it's like it's not particularly coordinated movements. It's a bit panicky, and it's yes. Yeah. Also, yeah, that's something that's um, characteristic of untrained fighters is that you overreact to what's yeah. going on, right? So yeah. you want to block a jab and you like block it like this, but like it's it's a super awkward. And, and then what happens is because you go too far in that direction, now you open here. And same thing, if your arms are just moving around, it's, it's not like controlled movements and you're exposing yourself. And uh, so, yeah, that was a good observation. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll go ahead and tell you about the behind the scenes. This interview was ahead, deleted yeah. very soon from Chinese social media. So okay. there were some copies on YouTube and I only looked at a few sections because it was a really long interview, but I actually had time to translate the entire interview and that's nice. going to be on the dojo. It's another site that I'm helping develop. So yeah, but, that's cool. um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a link on that too, but here's what happened. Um, Yu Chang Hua did have a leg injury. And during mm-hmm. the interview, you actually saw him show his leg injury. Basically, he was because you know he's used to hitting that that um uh, wooden dummy, right? So mm-hmm. he was trying to hit one of those kicking bags. Um, before this, he was trying to train and hit the kicking bags, and he kicked it wrong or something. And there was like a metal pole or something sticking out or something, and his leg, his, his like his knee hit the metal pole. So. Mm. So it was a he had a knee injury, a... and it was pretty gnarly looking scar. Now, again, I can't confirm his story. Maybe he actually gave himself a scar after the fight to be like, "Oh, I was." But that I was how long injury. before the match, though? Uh, it was a week before the match. Okay. So he yeah. claims it was a week before the match. He injured his knee. So okay. what he said was the reason why he looked so awkward is because he couldn't put weight on the side of his leg that was injured. So, guys. Right. You're hearing this on Patrick's channel, Effective Martial Arts. I haven't even put, told this on Fight Commentary. Right there. <laughs> exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> yeah, you will only hear this. I might not never put this on my channel because it's on Patrick's channel. Why not? Okay. It's an exclusive, cool. man. Thank he you very much put. for the scoop. Yeah, absolutely. So but that's something that uh, that we've heard before, like uh, uh, justifying, right? For especially yeah. these kung fu guys or, or some mystical martial arts guys, these ki or uh, internal energy stuff. When they lose, they they have a tendency to explain away yeah. their defeat, like yeah. with weird stuff like uh, oh uh, there, there was something in my coffee or the ground wasn't right or the sun was in the wrong angle yeah. like it's this weird stuff like yeah. just just yeah. own up to your defeat like everybody yeah. you win you lose just like own up to it you know yeah. why and as you're talking about this i remember there was a match i think it was sean o'malley he mm-hmm. basically broke his foot or something but he still won the match if you remember he was hopping at the very end but he still won so nice that's a kind of a good counterpoint to what even if you Chung Hua was injured, okay, yeah. you are the one claiming you're a third generation Itman master. So shouldn't you be able to fight through your injury and beat this one arm boxer? The yeah. boxer also has one arm, okay? Let's not yeah. forget that. True. Or, or if if you're just not up to it, just uh, postpone the fight. I mean, yeah. Yeah. if you're injured, you're injured. And that that yeah. happens. But I think uh, it's something that we see often. I mean, why do you think that is that, that like uh, these guys like explain away their defeat with weird excuses like that? Yeah. Um, why do you think, think it is? Part of it is just it's like you're in your own world. You don't want to face reality. I, let's just be mm. honest. I think it is like that. It's the confirmation bias thing that you were talking about. Right. 
yeah, so you, it's it's so outside of your conception to to want to question your own ability as a martial mm-hmm. artist that you yeah. you're you just kind of grasping for these weird reasons to justify why you're not up to your own mental image, right? Yeah. I guess it's yeah. like your ego or your your yeah your you're just yeah too convinced already. You don't want to question yeah. your assumptions, I guess. Yeah, confirmation exactly. bias. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's what it is. I mean, you maybe his injury was bad, right? So like it could. If it was bad. really that bad, he shouldn't have fought. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And the interviewer asked him, "It's like, why didn't you just not fight?" If mm-hmm. like you know, and, and he gave a bunch of excuses. But he said, you know, it's part of being the martial artist. I got to represent. You know, even for my hurt, I got to represent. And you know, my student, I got to help my student. So it's like, so it's well, like two s- sided. He wants both sides of the coin, right? Yeah, he wants yeah. to be like, I was there. Give me credit for showing up. But then because I lost, you also have to give me credit. You know, it's like no. Yeah, no, no. You don't. You don't get to <laughs> to claim that. Okay. Yeah, you don't get to have it both ways. Exactly. All right. So that's uh, number two. I think, yeah, the main takeaways, uh, definitely the, the distance management, the chin exposure, the lack of power. And uh, the one that we added with this one was the flailing arms, like yeah, overreaction yeah. to the strikes coming with yeah. inappropriate reactions, essentially. Yeah. Like it's not, you don't want to reach for the hands. You want to protect yourself yeah. or you want to yeah. get out of the way, right? Yeah. And, and I if think you that do was... reach for the hands, it's not to trap, it's potentially if this were an MMA match to get into grappling. Yeah. To right? grab, like get your inside ties, like yeah. get, get some, some clinch going, maybe a takedown, something, but yeah. Body lock, whatever, but underhook. Yeah. And okay. so here's the next scoop only on effective martial arts guys, All right. only on effective martial arts. <laughs> How did he become a master? Okay. Mm. He became a master, not by training under whatever student of it, right? Because he's third generation. He started out, believe it or not, as a hobbyist. This was revealed in his interview. He started out as a hobbyist. There's some kind of institute or organization. I don't remember if it's for Kung Fu or just for Wing Chun, but it's for whatever he wanted to be a master in that Mm -hmm. certified him as a master. And Mm -hmm. the interviewer asked him explicitly, so how much like real fight experience did he have? And he didn't beat around the bush. He basically said he didn't have that much. So to become certified as a master... You don't have to do any kind of kumites or sparring or whatever that many martial arts had. He literally mm. just had to take a bunch of courses. I think they're all like academic courses. Okay. That, so that's how he became a master. It's right. certified by some organization, mostly taking academic courses. And before he got certified, he was literally just a hobbyist. Hmm. So well, that, I know like that, a, a lot of martial arts like don't focus that much on sparring or fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh which I guess is okay if you're being honest about it. Uh, like, but in my personal opinion, like if you're going to do martial arts, you might as well learn how to fight. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the point. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing it correctly and safely, you, you can, you can do it well. Um, but some, some martial arts do say that they're not about fighting and if they're honest, that's okay. But I think that wasn't the case in, in this case. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. I think Wing Chun, um, especially after the Ip Man movies came out, really started yeah. portraying itself as, yeah, we're all about fighting. We can beat karate. We can beat boxing. Yeah, and it's a everything. superior method of fighting at that, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, where when they actually don't have any sparring experience or, or uh, proper methodology to, to develop that. Yeah. That's, yeah. 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 That's, that's, not, that's not cool. It's not correct. Yeah. It's not cool, man. And it goes with everything that Patrick talked about in my interview with him. And mm. it goes with everything he talked about on his channel. Don't please in the future, everyone, don't claim to be a master, yeah. especially of martial arts. You can say you're a master of martial arts history or mm. master of martial arts style knowledge or whatever, but don't call yourself yeah. a master of martial arts. There's a martial part to it. Yeah. If yeah, you just true. have a bunch of certifications and courses that are not this type of course. Yeah. Makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. Moving on. Uh, number three. Okay. Number three. Man, I'm having so much fun, man. Thanks yeah, again cool. for, for doing this. It's my pleasure. It's really cool. Yep. So I think it's something different that people enjoy. So by the way, comment below if you're enjoying this. Uh, let us know your thoughts about these matches and the future ones as well. All right. So this one um, was a Xu Xiaodong video. Xiaodong. And mm-hmm. I encourage you guys to watch the full thing. I only covered some of the parts. There's much more shenanigans in this. But okay. this was when they invited... A Tai Chi team, you know, who claimed they were really amazing um, okay. to, to come test out 
there grappling against the blonde dyed dude. That guy's a shri gel wrestler. So he's not even a Western wrestler. His style is in Eastern wrestling. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Like, we talked about that in an yeah. interview. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So basically okay. this is not like trying to make Western martial arts look good. Like he's an Eastern wrestler. Sure. I'm sure he spars like other wrestlers and MMA people, but he started out as an Eastern wrestler, a shui guy. He's, okay? he, he's part of this MMA gym, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's part of Shushai Don's MMA gym. Exactly. Shushai Don. Okay. Yeah. So, and then um, it's a versus a, a Tai Chi. A Tai Chi guy. A, a tai, tai Chi, chi guy who thinks his push hands is, you know, um, right, connections right. to the center, which are very cool stuff in Tai Chi. Um, but, you yeah. know, you have to have combat experience and not just push hands, right? Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> let's see if he can hold his own. So here All they right. go. Okay. <laughs> Look at the wrestler with the pressure. Tai Chi guy is a good sprawl right here. Or some people say it was actually the wrestler just had a bad takedown. But again, okay, so Taiji guy lost that exchange. For and now sure. he's complaining already, already <laughs> about the rules. <laughs> so, do, okay, do, you, uh, do you understand what they're saying? What's he complaining about? Um, basically, um, they're complaining about the double leg. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not allowed to touch Yeah, you're not allowed legs, to basically. do a double leg. <laughs> was, was that, like, not part of the rules or what? Um, um, there's going to be a big argument about it later, but what the referee, the, the guy, um, um, who's referring right now said was, of course it's allowed, but he didn't explicitly tell the Tai Chi side it's allowed. He just assumed they knew that you could, right. you could like double legs. Touch your legs. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrestling, dude. And so yeah. the first part is grappling only. Yeah. It's a, but yeah, only yeah. wrestling actually. It stops when it hits the ground. Yeah. So yeah. Wrestling only. Mm. And so. Um, so, so far the Tai Chi guy is not doing well. Yeah. Not doing well. He's, That's he's two lost takedowns every exchange. Versus so. Yeah. Two versus so. Yeah. And he that was he almost pulled him down. Yeah. Look at that. Lots of arm drags. Oh, his his knee hit the ground, I think. I think that yeah, see the, the Tai Chi guy's talking about how his, his knee hit the ground. So the wrestler's like, okay, okay, that's fine. We'll give that to you. We'll give that to you. We, for any you're allowed to put your knees on the ground and wrestle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not exactly. a takedown at all. You're not yeah. supposed to put your back on the ground. So look at Tai Chi guys really, really um tired so he's trying to stall arguing about the yeah, he rules. doesn't seem in very good shape for sure <laughs> yeah not at all yeah so yeah so um, I, i'm just listening to my old narration to see what they're complaining about but they're mostly complaining about the double legging and, and there's then, another shot and boom belly, right on you right on your belly. back right on yeah your back. he just he just goes to his back doesn't even fight for it at all yeah yeah his best his best attempt was the first time when he sprawled but okay. so so yeah um and that's it. Here they go. And then um, this next round, they're going to put on MMA gloves and do like light sparring. But if it's true, I don't gym, it's probably going to be hard sparring. So mm. um, this is when the Tai Chi side really starts arguing about the rules and calling it unfair. And mm. um, so, you know, they're, they're all trying to like debate about the rules and stuff like that. And um, eventually, Shusha Don't has a really funny tantrum. So we'll, we'll probably get to there. But you see, everyone's everyone's telling the wrestler he's doing a good job. Um, mm. And Look at uh, Tai Chi Chai just arguing about the rules again. They're, they're they're talking about okay. Did you did you tell them you can't do tr single leg, double leg? And basically, part of the argument was the Tai Chi side said you can you you can only hook the leg, so you can't grab the leg, but you definitely can put the crook of your elbow between the legs. So he's like, you know, he he can't grab the leg. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See that that's what they're talking about right now. Like you can hook the leg, but not grab the leg. That's what we agreed to. And this this That's wrestler so guy's like I want to beat this guy. Up. Come on, let's go. <laughs> and then do they actually? Um, they don't. So the Tai Chi guy quits. They just argue they and like then the, he quits. Yeah, okay. they argue and then they felt like the rules weren't fair to them, and then they just quit. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was a, a little bit different from the ones we've seen so yeah. seen so far. So the previous mm -hmm. ones were mostly uh, striking, kickboxing, then boxing, one arm boxing actually. Yeah. Um, and then this is more of a, a wrestling match essentially. Yeah. That's what it yeah. is. Exactly. Um, so takeaways from this one, in, in your in your opinion. So the most important thing is that oh, uh, I'm getting really really dark here. So let me turn on yeah. the light. We're the most important thing is that. These are two Eastern styles of martial arts. The, right, the Eastern is, wrestling, right? Yeah, Eastern wrestling and um, Tai Chi. The difference is the Eastern wrestling guy is at an MMA gym. So he's constantly yeah. pressure testing himself and learning other things. Right. So I but think in, that in, shows, the, in the Chinese wrestling style, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty similar to wrestling. Is there any differences? I'm not familiar with that particular sport. So I am not very familiar with Shui either. 
But from my understanding, a lot of their landings isn't like a break fall. A lot of their landings, they're trying to land with their feet hitting the ground. Because if you're wrestling, let's say, um, on the dirt or you're wrestling in some place that's not a mat, you don't necessarily want to break fall with your body, right? So right. a lot of the strides, y'all, like when you see how they land, they're not breaking fall. They're their feet well, well, hit the ground first. In, in wrestling, you, you never – I actually made a video on this. I think break falls are stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't practice them. I don't teach them. Mm -hmm. I think they're they're worthless. Uh, I mean, there's some application uh, kind of like from a, like a parkour or a stunt work perspective. If you do flat, kind of land flat on your back, you want to breathe out and you want to protect your head by tucking your chin. But in a combat situation, you never want to just – fall down there's a million things you need to do before and if you see it in wrestling in mma and wrestling you never see a guy do a traditional break fall like this or yeah. on one side it just doesn't happen like there's yeah. there's better things you can do like in in so i i don't think is that is that would there be any other differences between chinese wrestling and western wrestling um so um, Allegiate or uh, for example in judo right they wear gi in chinese yeah. wrestling they wear short sleeve kind of gi so uh, that they can the grab? Uh, you can grab the gi, yeah. Okay. But so, the assumption is the person's not wearing those long gis that you have in judo. Sure. So, um, so it's and kind then, of like a gi version of wrestling. Yeah, exactly. Like a gi, short sleeve gi version of wrestling. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, I think but they must pressure test as well. I mean, they, the, the, the object yeah, the, of the game is to put the guy on his back. Yes, yeah, exactly. So put the guy on his back or throw as, the guy. Yeah. Same as uh, collegiate or, or uh, any type of wrestling, right? Yeah. And okay. I think Olympic. Um, it might be like if if the entire guy hits the ground, you get a certain number of points. If mm. he, let's say, sticks out a hand or maybe one of his knees or like – so there, there's a bunch of like rules as to how many points he gets. Okay. And I think that's what Tai Chi guy was talking about with the knee. Like maybe the knee is a point. Or... If your knee and maybe another hand both – hit the ground, you might like, he might get one point instead of two or something like that. So oh, okay, I think okay. that might've been what the Tai Chi guy was saying, right. or he was just saying, Oh, his, his, oh I got to get a point. You know, he might not know. The but rules the, even side, then, though. I mean, it was a clear win. Uh, the guy yeah. put him on his back three times, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, so technical takeaways uh, from that. First of all, why did a Tai Chi guy enter a wrestling match and think that he would have a chance? That's a weird thing. Yeah. And well, I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> because they obviously volunteered to come, right? Yeah, they, they, they like it. So that's um, it's it's actually interesting because um, it's it's a pattern that we see over and over again. Like these guys, they accept these challenges, right? Uh, yeah. And they, they actually, so if they accept, it, it tells us that they must think that they are gonna win. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but what keeps happening over and over again is that just they they lose like overwhelmingly. Yeah. Uh, they they do not win, and it, it doesn't go well. And I think that speaks to the fact that in these types of martial arts, uh, there's a big, inf a big element of delusion. Yeah, one hundred percent. So they, they just, you, you, they just think that they're better than they are, and maybe they think it's because of the lineage or it's the, the mysticism that they've been indoctrinated in, um, or I don't know. But it, they, they definitely think that they're better than they are, and there's a lack of humility and perception of reality that's quite common in those uh, in these styles right yeah yeah and my immediate thought is maybe that guy who sparred the wrestler maybe at his tai chi gym he dominates everyone so yeah. he's looking at it from a lens of oh how bad can it be i'm beating everyone at my gym until right. he and which which are his against... students essentially yeah. right yeah, yeah exactly so yeah. i think it might be that you know what this is interesting too because one um these guys that that's one of the elements that reinforces those delusions right and it can even go so far as sometimes uh like there's different levels of it obviously uh the worst case being like these no touch knockouts where the guy just projects his chi and the people fly all over the place the students that are flying all over the place they actually believe that they're being doing this technique on Right. They believe that the guy is actually able to do it. Yeah. Uh, and it's because of the whole social aspect and uh, the in-group bias and the uh, confirmation bias. And they, they want to believe. So they kind of go with it. Yeah. Um, but even to a lesser degree, if you look at like Aikido, for instance, 
that's what happens in those schools as well. Maybe there's no, uh, there's an actual touch, like the guy grabs your wrist and whatever, but the student still complies and goes with the techniques and jumps on the ground. He's mm-hmm. doing it himself. He's not getting thrown by the, the sensei or the master. Um, but I think even like in more modern martial arts where there is pressure testing, there's always a certain sense of respect from students to the teacher, right? Yeah. yeah. Your students won't go that hard on you if you're their instructor or coach, yeah. right? Yeah. And this makes sense too, because what are you going to gain by beating up your coach, right? It doesn't yeah. doesn't make much sense. Um, so I think that's why it's so important for martial arts instructors specifically to go train at other places yeah. and just be the student yeah. and, and and get beat up by better people. I think yeah. that's something that I do uh, or at least before quarantine, but it's uh, it's so important because your students are going to be nice with you. Yeah. You, you want to have that experience of sparring with anybody else, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Very, very good point for especially people who coach, right? People who coach yeah. don't get complacent. Exactly. Yeah. And and don't think that you're better than you are because your students, they, they are going to be nice with you. It's it's yeah. it's a form of respect and it's normal. It's to, it's to be expected in the martial arts. But you do want to be the coach, be the instructor, but also be a student. Keep the student hat on from time to time to, to know, to be realistic about your own ability and cultivate you know, that's the things that you have to balance as a martial yeah. artist. You balance your confidence in your skills, which should grow as you get better. You have to balance that with humility as well and know that you're not infallible. You can lose uh, and, and you always have stuff to improve upon and to get better at. Yeah. Right? And that is a perfect segue to talking about Ding Hao, right? And mm-hmm. Yu Cheng Hua, because we know Ding Hao can throw down. Yes, he got beat up uh, quite a few times, as you see, but... I will 100% say that Ding Hao can beat up his master, Yu Cheng Hua. But okay. why doesn't Ding Hao call out Yu Cheng Hua be like, dude, coach, I think I can fight better than you, right? And a lot of it goes yeah. exactly to what Patrick says. It's it's about respect, right? There's a student-mentor kind of relationship. So you yeah. really have to realize, let's say Ding Hao and Yu Cheng Hua are sparring, which I assume they do in their Wing Chun gym. Maybe Ding Hao is going to take it easy on Yu Cheng Hua because Yu Cheng Hua yeah. is a little older and he's the teacher. So, yeah. But maybe if you don't have the humbleness or the reality as the teacher, you're like, man, I can beat up my best student who can beat up everyone else. That means yeah, I'm this better young, than my like, student. This young 20-year-old kid that's super yeah. strong, you know? Yeah. yeah they, they, that's how uh, some people get even more deluded yeah and yeah. delusional about their uh their, their abilities yeah. uh okay so yeah thing how so that was one of the honorable mentions maybe uh yeah or we'll get we'll get to it at the end if we have time to, yeah. uh, to show it but um i think the main takeaway from this one the tai chi versus wrestling is uh the the aspect of not being delusional about your own abilities and if you're a tai chi person that just does push hands don't think that you can win a wrestling match, yeah. right? Yeah. Same as if you're a Wing Chun guy, you just do sticky hands. Well, you're not going to do well against boxing. And you're yeah. certainly not going to be able to defend takedowns or be able to get out of a triangle choke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's just not going to happen if you have, don't have the experience. So, And remember that you're likely not Roy Nelson, right? So if you have a big belly and you're out of shape, nine times out of ten, you probably are going to fight out fight the person that's like very in shape. Yeah. Mm. Because the Tai Chi guy, obviously, like you point out, Patrick has a big belly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for yeah. sure. Like, I, it, it's not. You see some uh, MMA fighters that are not super lean. Like, if you look at Daniel Cormier. Yeah, Cormier. You know, he he has a little a uh, little bit of a uh, belly, but mm-hmm. he trains like crazy. He maybe eats a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. to keep this weight on and that's not a bad thing sometimes the yeah. extra weight can give you an advantage and mm-hmm. extra power in those punches but his cardio is on point right so uh mm-hmm. so you definitely if you if you want to do well in a longer exchange you got to train your cardio for sure yeah, yeah. Right? strength and conditioning all those aspects yeah all right so uh we have two more correct yeah so the next two are a two-parter okay. so around the fall of 2018 was you know, a lot of these crazy matches were already coming out. Um, some random Kung Fu master just came down from the mountains. This is the story, according to the promotion. And he's like, I'm going to show you guys that, you know, I, I was Kung Fu can fight. So okay. this guy went by the name Qing Feng Daozhang or Qing Feng Daoshi. I forgot which one. I believe it was Qing Feng Daozhang. Basically, Daozhang. Daozhang is like a Taoist master. 
So he called himself like a Taoist master from some mountain. He's trained, you know, he's Kung Fu trained. So this was one of the matches where he took on an MMA guy. So okay. let's see how he does this, this apparent master. So um, there's not much footage available. So this is all I could find. But um, I think it, it shows um, his apparent abilities. So okay. I'm going to jump a little forward. Here it is. So here, here we go. Oh, the, the, the MMA guy tried to kick. Look at that. And, and it from what it looks like, at least now, the, the the master has some explosiveness, right? We saw some explosiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his movements are definitely more coordinated than what we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, looking at this years later, it's mm -hmm. still it's still very telegraphed as punches. It's a bit amateurish. Yeah. 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 And what I don't know why MMA guy's not responding at all. <laughs> he's like just not. Like, you just cover. He's covering up. Yeah. He's not respecting the power at all. So yeah. those strikes don't look very powerful. Yeah. So do you think it's fixed? Um, I thought it was fixed hmm. because the way the announcers were were describing this, it wasn't that the the Taoist master was like was like just throwing and not really having much power. It was that he was throwing so well and throw so exposed explosively that the mma guy had no way to respond like the mma guy was overwhelmed yeah. which is not the case if, if someone sparred me like this like it would be easy i get punched way harder and yeah. way faster by certain people i spar with yeah he's just so, choosing not to respond yeah really. yeah the mma guy's choosing not to respond most people in the comments are saying yeah it looks like a fixed fight they literally paid the mma guy to be like just take his hits hmm and so again, I couldn't confirm or deny that at the time because you know I didn't have information on who this Dallas master was and who the MMA guy was. Right. Mm. So all I could do is I, I just said, look, here's what I see. Um, and you guys in the audience explain. All right, mm. um, is is this guy legit or not? So that's kind of where I left. He it he's not really doing kung fu. I mean, it looks like uh, average level boxing or Muay Thai, I would say. Yeah. And that was another thing that a lot of the people in the audience pointed out. It's like, okay, so even if he's some amateur kung fu guy who can fight, where's the kung fu? Yeah. Like it's we not, see uppercuts, uh, we see hooks to the body, we yeah, see exactly. attempts at clinches. Knees in a clinch. Yeah. Little short hooks. And so, he's pulling back his hooks and just Yeah, yeah. <laughs> telegraphing all his punches basically. His knees yeah. are okay, but he's telegraphing all his punches. He is transferring some weight, like the hips are there, kind of. The twist. Yeah. The chin is not overexposed, although he's not making big efforts to hide it either. Yeah, exactly. But he's yeah. not being defended. He doesn't need to defend either yeah. because uh, the guy's just not answering at all. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Does it keep going like that? It's just, just. Um, that this is all I have. This is all I have yeah. of the. Um, apparently he took part in three different matches. So this was one of the matches. I don't remember okay. if I found the other two, but it was probably a lot like this. Like okay. he was just beating out, beating up people really easily. All so, right. That was the story, right? And I was suspicious, but again, I didn't know. I'm not going to claim he's a fake master or whatever if I don't have the information. All I can say is this is what we see. Obviously, like you said, Patrick, he doesn't look like he's doing kung fu. He looks like he's doing very amateur kickboxing or Muay Thai. Yeah. And on top of that, why do we say amateur or you, you know even below amateur? Because telegraphing his hooks, his punch, yeah. you know, telegraphing this, a yeah. lot of stuff like. You know, like there's a lot of things he's doing wrong. And exactly, anyone yeah. that has trained should be able to take advantage of his very amateur mistakes. Yeah, he should expl exploit that with counters, but which he does not. So, yeah. So you have more information about this? Yes. And that's our part two. All right. So I did some research last year hmm. and I found who this guy was. Okay. So the guy, unfortunately, is not a Kung Fu master. That's me talking about yeah. him. That's so this one is of your his videos name. on your channel. Wang Xiaojun. He so changed his not, name for the first yeah, one? Yeah, that's his name. Yeah, <laughs> Wang Xiaojun. I found his name. But, but who's behind this? Like somebody wanted to like promote Kung Fu for some reason? Or? I guess so. I don't know why they dressed him up as, yeah. you know, <laughs> the little whomever. little suit and all that. Yeah, so this was a few years before they dressed him up in the Taoist costume. So this is okay. him. This is him taking place in like a regular like kickboxing match. This He's is fighting some German. Um, this is in China too. So, you know, they're not going to try to make 
um, non-Chinese people look good, right? So mm. this guy's probably, they thought this German guy would be an easy person to beat. Okay. So this is our quote unquote Kung Fu master. He is not. Does this guy a like Kung have a record? Is it, is it, do you do like more fights or? Um, I only found two and both okay. of them he lost. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. So this is, you can see some of his, um, some yeah. of his weaknesses, like, you know, swing yeah, wildly, his chin, chin exposure. Sticks out. Yeah. But it's still hooks. Like, I mean, it's still yeah. some level, some form of kickboxing. Yeah. So he's definitely had training, but I don't, I doubt it's training in any Kung Fu. It's probably Sanda is the closest yeah. Kung Fu he's had, but I don't even know if he's trained in Sanda. It's, but it's not like <laughs> some Taoist thing that they were going to portray him as. Yeah. No, the Sanda is, uh, for those who don't know, or, or viewers, it's, it's kind of like the, the Chinese kickboxing, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's it kind of falls under kung fu because if you yeah. if you're uh, literal about it, kung fu can refer to all Chinese martial arts. Yeah, yeah. and even more than that, kung fu can be like the, the discipline acquired through practice. You know, the yeah. actual yeah. meaning of the word. But yeah. Um, yeah, he he's not in a traditional kung fu style like the Taoist style with the yeah. katas yeah. and the stuff. And <laughs> the German guy's taking advantage of his his, his exposed chin. Yeah. Um, he, we saw a lead hook and oh, oh, there, oh, flying knee. Oh. There we go. Lights out. Oh, okay. So and that was one of the matches. That's all she wrote. <laughs> exactly. And then we have an um, we have another match here. This Same is guy. him again. They're pairing him up. You know, um, they're pairing him up against foreigners because they like making Chinese people look good, right? He pulled half guard. <laughs> yeah, he pulled half guard. <laughs> was that intentional? I don't know. I don't know. But either way, it's like they're making him fight foreigners in China. So I, th the purpose usually is to make Chinese people look good, and he's still losing. It's like <laughs> they're what trying the heck, to make him look man. good, but it's not working. Like, yeah, but here oh, he's not like supposed to represent traditional kung fu. He's just uh, exactly uh, Chinese guy. Exactly. In the here he's match. just kind of representing a Chinese fighter. Exactly. Okay. That's a very important distinction to make. Like maybe if he represented kung fu in these matches, they would tell the foreigner to lose. Hmm. And guys, um, it doesn't seem fixed. Yeah, it doesn't seem fixed. And um, I, I learned about this from Xu Xiaodong before he was censored. Xu Xiaodong gave interviews where he talked about this, how the most notorious is when they pay Japanese people. Like all mm -hmm. these like, oh, versus a Japanese karate master. All mm -hmm. that's like just paying Japanese students a lot of money to take a fall. Right. So that's how I knew. And that's why these matches, I'm always very skeptical. And I give mm. credit to Xu Xiaodong for kind of informing us before his interview was taken down about a lot of these fixed matches. Yeah, <laughs> that was <laughs> overcommitted. Yeah, yeah. So by lock and, throw. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong, guys. Maybe they didn't pick a weak, you know, um, West, Western guy or this guy's Brazilian. They didn't pick a weak mm. Brazilian. So, you know, maybe they didn't. So either way, it doesn't matter. It's he's, he's well, outmatched. It's, yeah. Look at that. Like the guy yeah. cr crossed him. But yeah, this is just a guy who has some kickboxing experience and yeah. a kickboxing match. Yeah. And okay. wasn't very good. And then they're like, oh, we got a way to rebrand you. Look at that. Is Ooh, that? There we is go. that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he won. He got, and, knocked, uh, he got TKO'd. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. So takeaways from those two and, and this guy, I think uh, what, what was new here is kind of the whole kind of deception aspect of, of like <laughs> yeah. wanting to, to promote Kung Fu as an effective fighting style. So that is, I know it's a thing. Like uh, Chu Saodong talked about it, and yeah. uh, it, it's been big. And like the Chinese government wants to, I don't know why they want to promote traditional kung fu as as being effective. Like it's a thing. I, I've seen you've seen a lot of things about it. You yeah. probably have more information than I do. Yeah. Um, so I think it was Inkstone that interviewed me about this. But basically, okay. I just told Inkstone, and I wish I I dug up all the all the stuff I wrote them. But basically. I, I there's a lot of money in mm. promoting kung fu, right? All these movies, tourism, classes. right? But yeah, people people actually go to the Shaolin Temple still to like yep. learn traditional martial arts, but thinking that they're going to be like super powerful yep. and and like learn actual fighting when it's it's really basically just choreography, some conditioning drills, and and basically tricks like demonstration tricks. Yeah, you know? exactly. Shaolin, that's what you're learning. You're not learning to fight at all. Yeah. 
And the thing is, it is part of soft power, right? If you guys know about any kind of diplomacy or international relations, mm. it's a good way to kind of get people to like you. You know, uh, it's almost like I don't – soft power is not the right word. You, the word is if you took the word public relations and mm. applied it to um, diplomacy. So you call it like public diplomacy or pub international diplomacy. But basically it's the same vein as public relations. What PR mm. is, you're creating a positive image of a brand or a product or a person by just getting people exposed to certain things, right? Mm. So – you know, when Nixon visited China, mainland China, current China, you know, non-Taiwan China, mm -hmm. when Nixon visited China, a bunch of things came over to America to really improve people's perceptions of kind of the Chinese culture. One, um, ping pong, right? Ping pong diplomacy, as they called it. So get sports teams to interact. Mm. Um, Kung fu, right? Jet Li came over too. Okay. Right. Kung Fu came over, you know, all these dance foods came over to kind of show, look at all this cool stuff, man. And then, of course, pandas, right? Pandas are part of public diplomacy, too. You know, you give mm. people these cute animals. And like, so a, a lot of a lot of this this Kung Fu stuff, there, there's just so many layers behind it. That's not just Kung Fu. You know, there's money. Like we said, there's like Political perceptions, too. you know. So, yeah. Um, so it's like a, it's like a deep and kind of shaky thing to kind of like you know unsettle right? you got to be careful how you how you challenge conventions right right, right. And, and there, there was why, a, that makes me think uh, there was one thing uh recently this um this woman uh, i forget her name uh in actually in the ufc i think and they did a whole promo about her this this uh chinese fighter she uh John Lee? Might be, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the name, but uh, the the whole promo about her in the UFC was very like traditional kung fu. -y, mm -hmm. Even though like she doesn't really do traditional kung fu at all. Like you would, they would dress her up and do like those demonstration tai chi moves and whatnot. But she's an MMA trained fighter. She's yeah. not at all. And, and so that, yeah. that's also another example of how the Chinese government is striving to promote this kung fu identity and the. The tradition of, of martial arts in uh, in their homeland, right? Yeah, and um, uh, first thing about John Whitley is she does do at least from my understanding, she does do some fascia training. So it's like a very uniquely Chinese like kung fu thing. Okay. So that's the extent of kung fu that I know about. But I've seen Patrick exactly what you're talking about. I've seen in the recent marketing, especially, I see her like exactly. hanging out with all these like Tai Chi guys and everything. Yeah. Even though uh, some of the Tai Chi community, including I think either Ma Bao Guo or Lele, or maybe both of them, both of those mm. Tai Chi frauds who both got knocked out, both of them were talking smack about John Wen Lee, but I forgot which one. It could have been both. Mm. So, mm. like, it, it didn't seem like the Tai Chi community was behind her, but, you know, I guess it's changed now. Mm. Indeed. Well, uh, I think uh, it's it's definitely something that our viewers need to be informed about. Yeah. Um, yeah. The 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 whole marketing image uh, that that Kung Fu tries to to portray, and all these challenge matches that happened recently. I think uh, you did a great job in selecting those those matches because it really illustrates uh, one on the technical level how um, how it's just inadequate faced with real pressure and we didn't we saw a bit of wrestling we didn't even like see against a grappler right on the yeah. ground which uh most kung fu styles as far as i know don't have any training whatsoever in that area uh mm. so you're helpless you're like a baby if you don't know grappling and you're facing a, a trained grappler you're just you're just sinking uh you have no recourse whatsoever yeah. so on the technical side um i've talked about this in my video why i quit kung fu is that there's two things that make a style or a uh, martial art effective. And the one is the rule set. So you want to include as much options as possible, striking, kicks, elbows, knees, clinch, takedowns, grappling, submissions, ground and pound and all that. Uh, and then the practice methodology, which essentially is pressure testing, right? If you don't pressure test your techniques, you will most likely think that you can fight. Or if you just pressure test in a narrow area against a specific set of techniques, but not all of them, you can develop some delusions, which is not a good thing because you want to be honest about your abilities and you want to move forward in your skills. Yeah. Uh, and then conversely, we talked about this in our interview as well, is you do want to pressure test, but you don't want to injure yourself either. You want to practice yeah. intelligently and then apply progressive resistance in order to improve your skills and yeah. not just get beat up or injured, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's number one, technical side, practice methodology. Uh, number two would be the, the aspect of delusion that we see 
uh, and and why these guys actually accept these challenges, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you you think you're you're better than you are, and that's not a good thing, in martial arts or otherwise. You want to be honest about your abilities, and then third is that whole political marketing aspect that surrounds it, yeah. which we need to be uh, informed about uh, in order to stay uh, objective and have some critical thinking, and hopefully uh, better move forward. Yeah, and the the second thing about that is, it's so. In a way, it's it's so counter to how Chinese culture is because is China has always been the culture that absorbs other people. Invaders just become more and more Chinese, right? Even mm. you look at now, like the West is becoming more and more Chinese in its kind of thinking and its kind of like mentality, I think. Why so, would you say so? Um, Actually – I don't want to jump down that rabbit hole yet. That might be another okay, video. Sure. So pretend sure. I didn't say that. But in the past, you know, Chinese culture traditionally started out in the, the Yellow River, you know, and then there, there's two rivers, right? The Yangtze River and the Yellow River. And eventually the Bashu, so Sichuan, the, the part where I'm from, got incorporated into China. But a lot of what China now is was not part of China, right? It was not part of the Han people. So mm. all these people would invade, all these people would come in, but they'd get sinicized. So mm. the reason I'm saying all this is because so what if like you incorporate Muay Thai and you incorporate karate and you incorporate Taekwondo yeah. in your martial arts? All it shows is the beauty and the brilliance of Chinese culture that everything will eventually be incorporated into the Chinese culture. Isn't mm. that like – doesn't that actually show – how great the Chinese culture is. That's why the Chinese culture, if you believe their story has adapted and been there for 5,000 years continuously, because it's mm. able to adapt and, but also stay rigid at the same time, but adapt correctly. So the mm. Chinese culture now is still the same as it was 5,000 years ago, if you believe that. But I'm just trying to present another view. Like if you really were to promote like Chinese nationalism or how great the Chinese culture is, showing Chinese people doing well in MMA Actually, I feel like makes China look really good. Why do you have to yeah. force like Kung Fu down people's throats when like the fact that the Chinese culture has always been in, able to incorporate good stuff from other people, but also right. make them Chinese. So like you can have the best like millions of Chinese MMA fighters that beat up everyone else. Why does that yeah. make China look bad? No, exactly. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's something that I believe very strongly in is uh, the importance of progress and innovation. Right. Um, I think it's it's so important to just learn from whatever source that we can find and then yeah. constantly work on getting better and not getting stuck in traditional thinking, doing the same things over and over again, just because that's the way things were done. Yeah. And I think that's a great example of it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, very good lessons for our viewers. Any closing thoughts before we wrap this up? Yeah, I will say um, I really love drinking matcha tea, especially because <laughs> I now know how to stir it properly. So the matcha is like foamy. Okay, but um, matcha tea is actually how tea was made in ancient China. Right. The when the Song Dynasty fell to the Mongols, China lost its ability to make tea correctly. So now, like Chinese Chinese people drink tea leaves and stuff. That's not how yeah. ancient Chinese people drank tea. They would grind it up into what we call matcha now. The powder. So, yeah, I had yeah, put that in my coffee. It's actually yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it's beautiful and it's good antioxidants. It's better than like the tea leaves. Okay. But the Japanese people got so inspired by Chinese culture, right, that they kept it. They, 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 they took everything from the Tang Dynasty. They took the dress, you know, a lot of the language. They took the buildings, a lot of the culture, you know, including mm -hmm. the tea. So, like, the, the Japanese culture, the matcha tea making is, like, authentically Chinese. So okay. I guess I'm just saying this because – Chinese Kung Fu definitely inspired a lot of stuff, just like Chinese tea making, you know, is still kept in Japan authentically. Mm. So, like, just celebrate the fact that, like, yes, Kung Fu inspired Taekwondo and, like, karate and stuff. But mm. just because, you know, Kung Fu, a lot of the styles can't fight now doesn't mean anything, you know? MMA, I'm sure half those MMA guys grew up, like, thinking about Kung Fu and stuff like that or trained in systems that descended from Kung Fu. So like, right. there's what's where's the pride in this? Why do you have to have so much pride in this? Like mm. everything that's in this world is probably descended either from some kind of Kung Fu or some kind of pancreation or something. Right. So like I'm just saying like the Chinese culture has touched and 
affected so many things and kung fu mm. too like you don't have to stick to old traditions and like right. pretend it works or you know be in diluted states you know so yeah that's why closing statement a little bit flustered but i this is stuff that just gets me frustrated sometimes and it's like it doesn't have to be thought of this way right that's a that's a very interesting point i think uh, you're right um about not claiming to be something you're not. I think that's so important. If if traditional martial arts hope to continue to exist, uh, they, they can't be advertising something that they don't deliver on, yeah. right? For mm -hmm. sure. But in my opinion, I think uh, it needs to go away. I, I think there's no, in this modern times, I mean, it's a nice page and chapter in the history books, but I don't think it's relevant today. Like martial mm -hmm. arts should be about fighting It should be about becoming a better person, helping other people, learning to protect yourself, protect your loved ones. And I think outdated methodologies shouldn't be practiced anymore. I agree. I, agree. I think they, we need to evolve. And like, okay, let's respect the traditional martial arts that came before as a stepping stone. But it, it, the respect doesn't mean that we need to keep them alive. Exactly. It can stay. A, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, that's it. That, that was my yeah, point. Yeah, the respect or the matter of pride, ethnic pride, national pride, whatever, is the fact that what came before has really inspired and evolved yeah. into what it is now. Why can't exactly. that be enough? Like, I'm yeah. so proud of where, you know, what I'm training because all of it had some influence from Kung Fu a long time ago, but it doesn't mean I go train in Kung Fu. Exactly. The, be the best analogy I found is uh, the typewriter. Yeah. Right? Great invention. Not useful anymore. <laughs> yeah right we have computers yeah. now <laughs> yeah so uh anyways guys uh that's all the time we have if you guys want to hear us talk more about traditional uh, kung fu and specifically why i think in my professional opinion i spent 10 years studying it it is suboptimal and we go in detail on wing chun kung fu specifically we go into the seven fatal flaws of wing chun i'll link this video right here you guys can go and check it out hope you have fun jerry it was a real pleasure having you on our channel and uh i wish you all the best i think uh, only good things will come in the future looking forward to seeing what you have on your channels fight commentary breakdowns fight commentary grappling and fight commentary chats that's right that's right patrick thank you so much this was so fun and when all this is over man i either will come to montreal to meet with you in person or please come to la that would be awesome man i would love to have you at our gym and uh we'll uh, we'll do some training make some cool videos together Definitely. Thank you so much, guys. And everyone watching, thank you.